Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to the start of MDDI's Focus on Fundamentals, Vaporized Hydrogen Peroxide Sterilization, Guidance and Considerations, sponsored by Nelson Labs and broadcast by Informa. It's day one, and we'll be discussing a complete guide to cleaning validations. I'm Omar Ford, Editor-in-Chief of MDDI, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to click the Register Now button in your viewing window and join us for the remaining two days of this Focus on Fundamentals series where we'll be discussing biocompatibility and toxicological considerations. And no, day three will conclude with a panel of all of our series speakers addressing your questions. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click the help widget found at the bottom of your screen or type your issue into the Q&A area and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now, on to the day one presentation. VH202, Sterilization Considerations. Discussing today's topic is Bryce Telford, Senior Sterilization Expert, Expert Advisory Service at Nelson Labs, and Jason Pope, Senior Scientist at Nelson Laboratories. To learn about our speakers, please visit the speaker's widget. Jason, over to you. Thank you, Omar. Okay, uh, today I'd like to just discuss uh, some of the basics about VH202 sterilization. I'd also like to talk a, a little bit about um, recent developments in the industry and recent regulatory considerations that folks should be aware of. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. So first, let's talk just briefly about some of the recent regulatory changes that we've seen in the industry. Um, one important development uh, that's worth uh, discussing briefly is the publication of ISO 22441, and that was published in 2022 by ISO. Uh, the title of that document is Sterilization of Healthcare Products, Low Temperature Vaporized Hydrogen Peroxide, Requirements for the Development, Validation, and Rooking control of a sterilization process. What's that? So um, that document, um, first of all, provides requirements uh, for the uh, development, validation, and routine routine control of a vaporized hydrogen peroxide process and includes uh, the, the items that you'll see on the first slide here, uh, which include uh, sterilization agent characterization, process and equipment characterization, product development, or I'm, I'm sorry, product definition, process definition, validation, routine control and monitoring, product release from sterilization, and maintaining process effectiveness. In addition to the requirements that it provides for those using this form of sterilization, it also uh, provides guidance on a number of top topics. Um, the, that guidance includes um, bioburden-based <laughs> validation methods as well as the overkill method, which um, tends to be much uh, more commonly used. Another regulatory change uh, that should be uh, discussed briefly is the reclassification of vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization by the US FDA. Um, 
the US FDA has listed vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization as an example of an established category A method of sterilization in uh, the guidance document listed in the slide, uh, which is entitled Submission and Review of Sterilization of Sterility Information in Pre-Market Notification, Piped in Case Submissions for Devices Labeled as Sterile. Uh, the FDA hopes that this will facilitate broader adoption of VHP as a sterilization method in the medical device industry. Uh, it's also part of their multi-pronged approach for reducing the use of ethylene oxide where possible. Uh, as we know, um, that has been an emphasis in the industry to look at um, additional modalities to supplement uh, ethylene oxide. It uh, further supports efforts to advance medical device supply chain resiliency. And um, I've included a link on this slide that uh, you, you should feel free to visit uh, to gather additional inf information. It's an FDA press release. <laughs> So how, um, how will these recent regulatory changes um, uh, potentially affect validation activities? Um, there, there are many ways that um, validation activities can be affected, um, and I've mentioned a few here. Um, so with the ISO document publication, it um, indicates that the international community is accepting this sterilization modality. Uh, when we um, were putting together the ISO document, um, there were uh, folks involved from many different countries um, throughout the world. And so this was a, a consensus document developed by, uh, you know, by, by folks from many areas of the world. <laughs> It provides standardized requirements and guidance for this sterilization modality so that um, we, we can make sure that we're all approaching this in a similar fashion. Now, there may be um, you know, requirements at a country level or um, regional level that need to be followed that maybe are unique, but this provides us with a standardized framework when we're developing these processes. And I've listed here, um, the FDA has um, given this uh, recognition as a consensus standard, and I've put that recognition information on the slide for you to review. Now, with the FDA reclassification, um, that indicates that the FDA has accepted this sterilization modality as um, as one that is safe and effective. It may reduce and streamline the required development and validation work. Uh, one of the areas I'm thinking here would have to do with um, sterilizing agent characterization, uh, some of the microbial work that goes along with that. Um, it may reduce the number of questions around validation testing if you're following ISO 22441. And it may streamline the submission process for items sterilized by uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide now that it has uh, been reclassified as a category A sterilization modality. So now let's move into considerations when choosing a sterilization modality. Um, Bryce, I will hand it over to you for your input here. Thank you, Jason. So is product and sterile barrier compatible with the chosen modality? So this is one of the things that we need to consider with any sterilization modality is we have to make sure the product is gonna survive the sterilization, but we also need to make sure that it's sterile barrier is going to survive that sterilization as well. So fortunately there are 
tools within the industry to help us uh, make some initial decisions and to guide us from the beginning. So one of those first tools is Amy TIR 17. Uh, it was initially 2017 and has recently been reaffirmed. And that has information on compatibility of material subject to sterilization. This is a very beneficial uh, TIR as it provides information for vaporized hydrogen peroxide, but also other sterilization modalities as well. And the reality is each modality has its advantages and disadvantages. And part of that is each modality has its kryptonite. So steam sterilization, or if you prefer moist heat sterilization, is a high temperature process and can be damaging to certain materials. Likewise, other sterilization modalities have compatibility concerns as well. So for example, radiation has PTFE, Teflon, EO has limitations with liquid sterilization, and vaporized hydrogen peroxide also has its own kryptonite, and that is cellulose. So when considering your product, your packaging, that is something to be aware of and ensure that if you're looking at that particular sterilization modality, that it is excluded from your product. The other item to con consider is uh, the material compatibility and how it's going to work out over the life of the product. So some of these materials, some of these products are going to be in a healthcare setting where they are reprocessed. So healthcare reprocessing where they're gonna be cleaned reused and re-sterilized. So the compatibility over the lifetime of that product also needs to be considered. The next consideration is the design compatibility. Does the product have lumen? Uh, are the lumens small or are they long? So very small lumens that are very long in length are going to be a particular challenge to sterilize and may not be suitable for the chosen sterilization modality. There may not be enough penetration from the chosen modality in order to sterilize the product. So to help with that for vaporized hydrogen peroxide, both the Sterad and the VPRO provide cycle guidelines that must be reviewed and considered when making your cycle selection. So you're going to want to go into the various systems to look up what those cycle guidelines are and ensure that your product is going to be able to fit, for example, in one of those sterilization modalities. Another thing that is not always as clearly considered is the product surface area. So there are some products that have a very large surface area by nature, and that is going to essentially use up a lot of the hydrogen peroxide uh, just due to the amount of surface area that is being exposed and has to be covered. So surface area is a consideration as well. And then your packaging compatibility. This takes a couple of different forms. So one is what is the nature of the packaging that you need to do? If you're doing vaporized hydrogen peroxide or gaseous sterilization, that packaging needs to be breathable. The product needs to be able to be exposed. So the gas, hydrogen peroxide or ethylene oxide, needs to be able to enter into that packaging. And that also means it needs to be able to exit that packaging as well. So the packaging needs to be considered as well as the configuration, for example, if we're only have a small area exposed that's breathable and we're stacking those against each other, such as a Tyvek poly pouch, where the Tyvek side is covered by the poly side, we're not going to have as good of uh, exposure as we may potentially like. Another thing, again, make sure and consider that cellulose, uh, it's a no-go. So cellulose packaging is not going to be an option for vaporized hydrogen peroxide. So the next, and I won't say final uh, consideration, but kind of the final for today's discussion is your biocompatibility. Are there residuals being left after sterilization? So are we getting that hydrogen peroxide back out of the product? And also with that, does the sterilization alter or affect the product? Hydrogen peroxide, vaporized hydrogen peroxide tends to be a lower temperature sterilization method. However, 
there are still uh, elevated temperatures being involved. There is vacuum involved. So does that sterilization process itself actually affect the product in some way that is going to negatively affect your biocompatibility, your material compatibility? So that leads us into implementing your hydrogen peroxide. And one of the considerations with that is your scalability. So is the modality able to be scaled to your production? So as some examples of industrial sterilization, we have radiation sterilization and it's carrier based. So your product is sent to an industrial radiator, it's loaded onto a carrier so it's offloaded off your pallets onto a carrier and you're generally able to scale your product and production to just include more and more carriers so it's able to be uh, scaled very reasonably and very quickly but that also means that it's set up for larger volumes of product if you make a single box of product an entire carrier may not be the most cost effective approach so eo you have the ability to scale by increasing cycles or also as you validate, including dunnage in your cycles so that you can vary it. But again, it's generally geared towards larger volumes of sterilization. Vaporized hydrogen peroxide is a little bit more limited in the industry at this time. So your sterilization options right now are mostly suited to lower volumes of production, lower amounts of material that is going to be sterilized. So with that in mind, is that something that's going to be able to scale with you being able to make more product, sell more product? Uh, is that something that is going to work for you in the long term? So the other consideration with that is who is going to be sterilizing the product? So is the product going to be provided terminally sterilized or is the intent for point of use? Is it going to be industrially sterilized uh, via a large scale processor? Essentially, who is going to be doing that sterilization uh, is a consideration. Uh, the other is wraps are generally good for point of use. So our packaging is a consideration when it comes to who is going to be sterilized. It. If it's gonna be point of use, wraps are a good option, but Wraps generally don't scale very well for industrial sterilization and providing product as sterile. Usually in those situations, instead of providing the wrap as the sterile barrier, you're adding an additional packaging layer, such as a pouch or something like that. So consider who's going to be sterilizing it is also going to help you consider other items such as what does your packaging configuration need to be, as well as what sort of validation work do you need, distribution testing, shelf life, things of that nature. So the question comes down to where does sterilization fit in the process? Is the sterilization able to be on site? Is that going to be something that you can do in line with production? Is sterilization going to be contract it out to a third party and provide on an industrial level? Or is the expectation that sterilization is going to be conducted and performed by the point of use, such as the hospital or clinic that is sterilizing the device? So with consideration for implementation and scalability, we need to consider how are we going to work vaporized hydrogen peroxide into our sterilization? What are our options if we want to move away from one of our uh, other sterilization methods and we want to implement hydrogen peroxide sterilization for our product? So let's talk first about what is available readily today. So First, let's talk about clinical. So when we're talking clinical, what we mean is point of use. This is product that is going to be sterilized at the hospital or at the clinic by the end user. So one of the first options that has been on the market for a very long time is the ASP Sterad units. So currently for the Sterad, there are three primary options. So one of the first is the Sterad 100S. So this is an older unit. It is an older technology to round, 
but it is also one that because it is older, it has quite a lot of availability around the world and it's still in use. Uh, one of the downsides to the Sterad 100S is that currently, particularly for the United States, the only cycle option that is available and kind of recognized is the short cycle. So if you're contacting us uh, and you're wanting to validate for the 100S, you're going to be basically your only option is the short cycle and you'll have to make sure that your product fits into that particular cycle and there are certainly limitations on that cycle such as lumen size lumen length that you would have to review and ensure it's an option so the next is one of the largest units that is offered by asp which is the sterad 100 nx um, it is a newer unit uh, compared to the 100S, and it is a very large unit. So physically, it is a large unit. It is going to take up some space uh, in order to be used, but it does have the most cycle options uh, when it comes to that unit. So it offers quite a bit of flexibility in being able to find the cycle that your product will fit into and then be able to be validated to. So it's normal cycles that it offers are the standard cycle, the flex, the duo, the express. And uh, it's actually one that was just recently announced this month, which is the Ultra GI uh, cycle as well. So it is a unit that is newer. It's gaining new cycles. Uh, like we said, the new one was just announced this month, uh, and it does offer quite a few different cycles for you to choose from, but it is a very large unit that kind of tends to relegate it more so to hospitals and much larger settings. But they also do offer the Sterad NX unit, so it's a smaller unit. It's more of a desktop unit, if you will. So it is a smaller unit, takes up less physical space. So that might be something that, for example, smaller clinics or smaller settings may choose to use and set up. The downside with that smaller unit is it does offer fewer cycles. So it does offer the standard cycle and what it's called the advanced cycle. So you can make sure that your product uh, fits in those cycles and see if one of those machines and one of those cycle offerings works best for your product. So the other available technology in clinical settings right now is the Steris V-Pro. So on the market right now, the two V-Pros that we basically work with to provide validation services for are the V-Pro Max 2, which is the largest of their units, and it has the most cycle options as well. Uh, being the largest unit, again, it is very physically size uh, requirement but that also does mean it has quite a bit of processing capability. So its cycles uh, to me are named a little bit more intuitively. So you have lumen, non-lumen, flexible, fast non-lumen and 3D specialty. So the cycle names tend to give you a little bit of an idea of what they're kind of more suited for. So the other option is the V-Pro S2. Uh, it's a little bit smaller and a little bit older unit uh, from Steris compared to the Max 2. Uh, however, it has uh, quite a few of the same cycles, so lumen, non-lumen, and fast and flex. So it is also a good option as well. And kind of being a little bit older unit, uh, it does have kind of that market presence where it has been out for a while uh, and has such as kind of in the market and available. So next is our available technologies in a more industrial setting, so industrial sterilization. So Jason, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Bryce. Um, now these are just uh, some options that are out there. Um, there, are, there may be other options as well. Um, but, but I am aware of, of these two options that I, I want to mention. The first is a company called DeLama, located in Italy, and they can provide options for companies considering uh, performing terminal uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization in-house. This may be an option for um, 
terminal sterilization where you place it at the end of your your product line and perform that um, in your facility. Uh, they do also pre uh, present other options for uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide as well. So if you're interested, check them out. Um, another option is a company called Eagle Medical. They are located in California and they perform terminal vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization for customers. So they act as a, a, a third party um, processor for uh, customers that are looking for vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization options. So uh, if that is something you're interested in, uh, please check them out. And um, finally, I wanna mention some uh, emerging technologies or some uh, newer uses for um, vaporized hydrogen peroxide. So first of all, uh, one, one use we are seeing is um, that um, folks are, are designing cycles to sterilize um, syringes that have been aseptically filled where um, the, the sterilization of those outer surfaces needs to be performed. So that's one newer application. Uh, also, um, as Bryce mentioned, we are um, seeing uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide of lumens for uh, items like endoscopes. Um, it uses a, a targeted injection of vaporized hydrogen peroxide into those lumens to increase lethality um, you know, for these harder to reach locations. Um, so that, that's actually being directly injected into lumens and channels. Uh, so that is a new application as well. And um, I think it's worth noting that I have, uh, I, I've not seen a lot of data, but I have seen um, some discussions that manufacturers are reporting promising results for scaling up this prod, um, process for larger production vessels. Um, if, uh, if you're interested in that, um, stay tuned. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll be able to see something that, that works on a larger scale. So now let's go ahead and move into validating the process. Um, just so you're aware, this is a very brief overview. Uh, we, we could probably talk about this for uh, the entire three days, but um, we'll, we'll touch on a few um, basic concepts. And um, yeah, so let's get into it. So um, oftentimes the first thing that a manufacturer might move into when they're validating the process is they need to uh, do cycle development or perform cycle development. Uh, we need to make sure that um, A, we can sterilize the product and B, that we, um, if necessary, we design a, a cycle that uh, performs the way we need it to perform. So um, as Bryce mentioned, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk first about compatibility of the process. And as Bryce mentioned, uh, we have Amy TIR 17, which talks about material compatibility. So that can be a good resource if you're thinking about using this modality or considering this modality for your product. Um, when we're performing cycle development, we also can perform exposures um, to determine a number of things. Uh, as mentioned, material compatibility. Do we need to run those materials through the process and then evaluate them afterwards to make sure that uh, the material performs as intended and that um, nothing unforeseen occurs with that material? Product functionality is another thing that we need to consider. Will our, will our completed product maintain its functiona functionality after it's been exposed to the process? Um, that's something that we need to check and be, be uh, certain of. And so um, by performing exposures, we can look at product functionality. Um, Another thing that we can do uh, with exposures is look at biocompatibility. Now, I'm not gonna get into the details of biocompatibility that will be discussed uh, in subsequent days, but um, 
that's another thing where we can expose product and then evaluate the biocompatibility of the process. One thing that's very important is can we achieve the lethality that we need to achieve with the process? So we can actually look at lethality. We can perform fractional cycle exposures and monitor that product with um, appropriate microorganisms, uh, often in the form of a biological indicator to make sure that we're able to achieve the lethality we need to achieve for the product. Uh, residues is another item that we can look at by performing exposures with the product. Um, we will talk about residues in subsequent days of this uh, series. So uh, I'm not gonna get into the details here. Uh, with pre-filled syringes, we may need to look at ingress. Does that vaporized hydrogen peroxide um, you know, penetrate into, say, that syringe and, and uh, get into that, that fluid inside the pre-filled syringe. That's something we may need to look at. And finally, um, does our packaging maintain integrity after exposure? And that's something that we can look at with exposures of the product. Another thing when we're developing the cycle is we, we may decide that we need to develop a process challenge device. A process challenge device, um, you know, having a, uh, a process challenge device that we can use when we perform routine sterilization can be a, a great option when we need to uh, monitor these cycles, our cycles microbiologically. So uh, we can perform fractional cycles to look at uh, what uh, I, t I commonly refer to as comparative resistance. That's looking at the resistance of our process challenge device candidates uh, versus the inoculated product where we put biological indicators inside that product and compare it to our process challenge devices that we may be considering. And then um, another thing that we can look at as well when we perform fractional cycles is the BI appropriateness versus the product bio burden. So we may run the process challenge device candidate versus um, the bio burden on the product. Uh, does the bio burden show less resistance than our PCD candidate? Uh, we, we would expect that to be the case, uh, but that's something that we often will look at just to confirm that it, it, it is true. So now, when uh, we're validating the process, we have three, three, di three different um, main considerations. And I'm gonna get into mostly the third consideration, but I wanna mention the first two as well. These are often performed by the sterilizer manufacturer uh, when those um, sterilizers are um, sold to uh, the user. So the first one is the installation qualification or IQ. Uh, we perform that to demonstrate that the equipment has been configured and installed as specified. So as, as I mentioned, that's often performed by the sterilizer manufacturer. Uh, the second thing that we need to consider is operational qualification or OQ. That is performed to demonstrate that the equipment can deliver the operating cycle as specified. Um, this, may pre this might be performed with um, an empty chamber. It might be performed with a loaded sterilizer. Um, depending on your location in the world, there may be uh, test packs that you would use as part of the operational qualification. And then finally, um, the area where we're going to spend the, the most of our remaining time is performance qualification. Uh, performance qualification, uh, that's conducted to demonstrate that the sterilizer performs to pre predetermined criteria, which includes the ability to deliver required parameters and to ensure that it can deliver uh, the, that the process can deliver sterilized product. Now, when we're talking about the pro, uh, performance qualification, uh, one of the first things we'll look at is microbiological performance qualification. That is performed with cycles designed uh, so that the extent of dose delivery is reduced 
from a routine processing cycle. Uh, for those of you with a lot of experience with sterilization, I'm sure you've heard of half cycles. That might be um, how we achieve dose, de dose delivery that is reduced from a routine processing cycle. We might run fractional cycles, um, but uh, the idea is that we reduce um, the dose delivery so that um, we're, we're able to generate results and then extrapolate those results to full cycle conditions to demonstrate achievement of the required product sterility assurance level or SAL. So ISO 22441 provides guidance on three different approaches to microbiological performance qualification. Um, two of them are bioburden-based approaches. You have uh, what we refer to as the bioburden approach. This is where we're looking at the product bioburden and our ability to um, reduce that product bioburden to an appropriate product through the assurance level. Next is what we refer to as a BI bioburden approach. You also hear this referred to as a combined BI bioburden approach. Uh, this is where we use um, a, a microorganism with uh, an elevated resistance to the process and, and examine its inactivation in conjunction with the inactivation of uh, product bio burden to develop a sterilization process. And then finally, uh, most people will be familiar with what is termed the overkill approach. The overkill approach is when we use a very resistant organism in high numbers to deliver um, a, a sterilization process that uh, is well in excess of what's needed to inactivate product bio burden. And uh, as mentioned on the slide, the overkill approach is the most commonly used approach um, when we're performing microbiological performance qualification testing. The overkill approach is most, um, first of all, it's performed with a uh, microorganism, as mentioned, of a high resistance to the sterilization process. Uh, the, the microorganism you'll hear most commonly referred to as Geobacillus sterothermophilus, and uh, this organism is what most in the industry consider to be the MRO or most resistant organism. When purchasing BIs, this is the organism you'll most commonly uh, come across. BIs, we take those BIs that we purchase or, or manufacture, uh, however we obtain them, we place those into the product and throughout the load in places that we expect to be the most difficult to sterilize locations. Um, those may be um, areas like lumens, um, crevices, mated surfaces, et cetera. Uh, they could be other areas as well. The inoculated load is exposed to reduced sterilization parameters as mentioned above. Um, we have two main approaches that we use when, when we're working with overkill sterilization. The first is what we term the half cycle approach. Um, we identify conditions that can inactivate a minimum population of 1.0 times 10 to the 6 CFU. Once we identify those conditions, those conditions are doubled for the full processing cycle. The uh, next uh, approach that we can consider is what's termed the cycle development approach. Um, this is where we use fraction negative or um, enumeration results to uh, determine uh, what will end up being our, our final uh, you know, full cycle. Uh, we might use the Holcomb Spearman Carver, uh, the limited Holcomb Spearman Carver, or the Stumbo Murphy Cochrane approaches when using this cycle development approach. Results, um, when we generate results, they are used to determine a, a cycle that will deliver a 12 log reduction to the product for the processing cycle. <laughs> uh, 
We also need to take a look at physical performance. So we also perform a physical performance qualification when we validate these processes. Um, this is where we measure physical parameters um, to ensure that the process is delivered to the product load. Um, we, uh, this, this physical performance qualification provides information correlating to microbiological performance. If we see physical results that do not confirm the microbiological um, results, then uh, we would want to look into those to figure out why that is the case. This provides um, correlation between routine process monitoring sites and product load locations. If we have selected a routine proce uh, process monitoring site, we need to see how that relates to performance inside the load and physical performance uh, qualification allows us to do that by, by measuring those um, parameters at those various sites. We place sensors into locations throughout the load inside product uh, if, if being used process challenge devices, uh, routine monitoring locations, et cetera, to measure physical parameters. An example of that would be temperature. And um, although we will get into um, addressing residues in detail in um, subsequent days of this series, I do want to mention the process very briefly. So um, to address residues, we'll expose the load to at least the full processing cycle. There may be times we uh, decide that we want to expose it to two times the full processing cycle or other worst case exposure conditions. Um, and that, that's something that might be made on a case by case basis. Once we perform the required exposure, we want to uh, quantify the hydrogen peroxide residues coming off of that product. So we perform testing to um, get those numbers. Once we get those numbers, uh, we can also perform cytotoxicity testing. We may have uh, uh, samples that are devoted to that test specifically. So um, that's, that's something we may perform. Uh, but what we do once we get those hydrogen peroxide residue uh, numbers, a toxicological risk assessment is performed um, with uh, the residue numbers, and we base that on patient contact details to determine whether the product um, has safe levels of residues or not. We also, um, as part of the validation process, we need to address packaging. Packaging is an important uh, component, and it's something that maintains our sterile uh, condition after exposure. So um, package testing is performed with samples exposed to at least the full process. We may choose worst case conditions, as was mentioned above. We might say that we want to expose to 2x processing, or we decide that there's another worst case condition that we want to consider for that testing. We um, demonstrate with those exposed samples, we demonstrate that the sterile barrier is able to be maintained after exposure to the process. So once we validated our process, we need to uh, come up with a way to routinely monitor the process. This is primarily performed with measurement of the process and cycle parameters. Um, however, there are areas of the world where microbiological monitoring may be required uh, or chemical monitoring may be required. So you want to make sure that you um, are following national and regional requirements as well. If you're uh, the subject of any pharmaceutical or uh, uh, pharmacopeal um, requirements, you want to follow those. So routine monitoring locations and locations of BIs and CIs are defined. Uh, the validation testing should have defined those locations. So we, we want to make sure that um, we have defined 
those locations where we're going to either perform routine monitoring or we're going to place our PIs and CIs. Uh, oftentimes, visual inspection of exposed product may occur uh, during routine, uh, pro uh, you know, when we're releasing from the process. Uh, parametric release in industrial settings is not commonly used at this point in time. And as mentioned, regional requirements regarding product release should be followed. So, um, you know, I, I've not, I personally have not um, worked on any processes that are released parametrically. And I am not aware of processes that are released parametrically at this time. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't anything out there, it's just something I've not seen. So, if re sterilization is to occur, we need to make sure that we build that into our validation testing. And that's why um, I had mentioned 2x sterilization. That may um, that that helps us to cover a situation where re-sterilization may need to occur. <laughs> Finally, uh, once we've validated the process and we know how we're uh, monitoring it routinely, we need to ensure that the process uh, remains effective over time. So we need to maintain process effectiveness. After specified events such as repairs, part replacements, et cetera. Portions uh, of the, the following items might need to be uh, repeated. We might need to repeat the installation qualification, uh, the operational qualification, and or the performance qualifications. So um, anytime we make a change, we need to make sure that we're following change control. Change control is required to determine um, when additional testing might be required. Um, change control could relate to um, equipment changes. It could relate to process changes. It could relate to product or packaging changes. And it could relate to loading or configuration changes or even other items. So uh, we need to make sure that we have good change control with this process and that we look at uh, any changes that occur. Um, we also need to make sure that we uh, define our requalification intervals and um, that we look at routine cycle, uh, routine sterilizer performance, the ability to meet the required parameters, et cetera, when we determine that requalification interval. And requalification results could trigger a full PQ if original performance is not maintained. If we see a situation where uh, we are, are not maintaining the performance that was established during the validation, we need we may need to requalify the entire process. So. <laughs> Finally, I would like to um, just mention um, some uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide considerations. Uh, some of these we already touched on and um, others maybe not, but let's just quickly go through the list. So. Um, some of the older vaporized hydrogen peroxide processes may not exhibit the same amount of sterilant penetration as ethylene oxide. Um, I have seen this in testing where some more complex devices might struggle through some of the uh, healthcare cycles that are, are long established. Um, it, it may be hard to achieve required uh, sterility assurance levels if you have a very complex uh, device. So, um, that should be considered. I will say though that um, new process designs, sterilizer designs, et cetera, um, are allowing for direct sterilant injection into long lumens and channels. And um, therefore success has been observed with flexible endoscopes with modified sterilizers. So uh, I think gains are being made here and, and that's something that folks should be aware of. Uh, as mentioned, cellulose is not compatible with this process. Um, that requires oftentimes during sterilization that we remove product from secondary packaging prior to loading it in the chamber. And um, we need to make sure that we avoid packaging options that contain cellulose. 
Um, one thing I just want to mention in closing is that residues do need to be addressed during validation. Um, we have seen in the past where um, some claims have been made that um, we don't need to worry about residues because everything breaks down to uh, water and oxygen. However, um, regulatory agencies expect that we will examine sterilant residues. It is addressed in ISO 22441. And um, so it's something that we need to make sure that we're looking at during uh, validation. And surface area, uh, I, I have seen this in the lab. Surface area can affect the performance of the cycle. So materials with large amounts of surface area uh, might require modified sterilization parameters to ensure there's enough sterilant in the chamber to achieve required lethality. Uh, one of the things that could affect it is if you, uh, for example, are running a, a healthcare cycle with a lot of packaging material or um, wrap material, I have seen where that can affect delivered lethality. So it, you may have a situation where you need to run um, longer or more robust sterilization parameters to ensure that you're achieving sterilization. And that concludes the information that uh, Bryce and I wanted to present today. So I think we're at a point where we can uh, start to take a few questions. So I will turn uh, the time back over to Omar and we can go ahead and proceed with that. Now, before we begin with today's Q&A, please direct your attention to our webinar survey available on the right of the presentation window. If you close the survey, you can reopen the widget by clicking the icon along the bottom of your screen. Thank you in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey allows us to better serve you. And now on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, just type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window or click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If we're not able to answer all submitted questions during today's webinar, we'll be sure to share them with our speakers who can reply to you offline. And now let's go into one of our first questions. What are some examples of products that can't be VHP sterilized? One of those items uh, we have mentioned is anything that's, that contains cellulose. Um, I have personally seen uh, the effects that cellulose inside the load can have on uh, delivered lethality. Um, that's generally a material you want to uh, avoid. Uh, another thing that you want to um, generally avoid is the, trying to sterilize liquids through vaporized hydrogen peroxide. I know that was mentioned um, for ethylene oxide, but it's also a consideration here. I did mention pre-filled syringes. Uh, with those pre-filled syringes, uh, what we might see is that uh, that fill has been performed aseptically and we're trying to just sterilize the outer surfaces of that syringe so that when it um, is packaged, it's, it's able to maintain sterility on, on those outer surfaces. And I would just add that one additional item is we have seen some products with exceptionally long lumens and those just generally tend not to be suitable. Interesting, interesting. In addition to sterilization of reusable devices at the healthcare facility, um, are there, is there serious potential for H2O2 sterilization for single-use devices by the manufacturer? Moment, Omar, I will answer this. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to read the question again. In addition to sterilization of reusable de devices at healthcare facility, is there serious potential of H2O2 sterilization for single-use devices by the manufacturer? Uh, we did touch on this, and um, 
yes, I would say there is serious potential of uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization for single use devices by the manufacturer. Um, this is a, a sterilization modality that might be a great fit um, for say like end of the line sterilization where it comes off the line and it goes into a vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilizer is sterilized and um, then loaded into final packaging final secondary packaging so yes our next question is is the MRO in VH202 different than that in ETO? Yes, uh, most commonly you will see um, that biological indicator manufacturers are using geobacillus sterthermophilus for vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization monitoring. Uh, where uh, ethylene oxide sterilization would use commonly Bacillus atrophius for um, sterilization monitoring or, or process monitoring, I, I think is maybe a better way to say it. Do we use double cycle sterilization to check if the packaging maintains the sterile barrier? We don't, we're not required to do that, but it, it is quite common because a lot of manufacturers um, would like to um, ensure that if they need to re-sterilize product, that they're able to do so. So uh, an example might be you process your product through a cycle and a non-conformance is, is observed, and that requires that the product go through the sterilization process a second time. If we don't validate that 2x processing, then we would need to validate it at that time. So um, it, it is something that some manufacturers will address by performing 2x sterilization uh, when they're validating the process so that they can ensure that uh, re-sterilization does not affect that packaging, I amongst other have... things. Yes, yes. And I, I think we have time for one last question here. Um, what does parametric release exactly mean in terms of sterilization? Any takers for that one? Yeah, and we can get the exact definition from, um, you know, the, the exact ISO definition. But um, what it is, is we are looking at parameter, physical parameters to release from the process. So we might be looking at um, temperature, uh, pressure changes um, that, that we are able to achieve required pressure settings and, and uh, rates, um, it, humidity requirements. Um, so we're looking at physical parameters to release the load. Um, oftentimes, um, at least in the U.S., oftentimes um, it, there's a preference towards microbiological monitoring where we look at the results of biological indicators coming from those um, routine cycles. Now, a really good example of parametric release would be something like radiation sterilization where we aren't looking at um, biological indicators routinely. So um, I hope that answers the question. If not, uh, we can provide additional information um, offline. Yes, yes. And that um, concludes our time. And that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you. We appreciate your time and expertise on today's topic. Thank you to our sponsor, Nelson Labs, as well as to everyone in the audience. We appreciate your attention and participation. Within the next few hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may have not been available to listen to the event. This webinar is copyright 2024 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Informa Markets. The individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guests, Bryce Telford and Jason Pope. I am Omar Ford. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.